You would. We're going to pick up the story we left off a couple of weeks ago. Um, we know that the Bible contains a lot of information, of course, the inspired Word of God. It's got a lot of historical information there. It's a record here of an amazing array of events recorded in the Word of God. But it's not a history book. It's not designed to be a history book, any more than a science book or a math book. It's designed, of course, to teach us spiritual lessons. And so when we read through the accounts, particularly of the nation of Israel and the circumstances they were contending with and other uh, peoples and other situations, we're reminded that we're supposed to be learning from them. So there are lots of uh, illustrations, examples, figures, types uh, that are set forth in the Old Testament and the New too, uh, to teach us some very fundamental spiritual truths. Because that's what it's really all about. God doesn't want us here to build up a, a worldly natural empire of any nature. He wants us to prepare, be prepared for his kingdom, a spiritual kingdom. And he wants to equip us and get us ready for his uh, son's return that we might be part of the, the spiritual realm. We don't fully understand that we're very much caught up with this natural realm. So we, we don't fully understand there's something beyond this. But it, it clearly has to be. God is in another realm altogether. God is spirit. And the spiritual realm is awaiting us. And it won't be uh, restricted to time and space and matter. It will be a uh, different understanding and comprehension altogether. So there are lessons there. We've, we've been told these things to encourage us and, and let us to get ready for that glorious future. And the Bible foreshadows uh, the glorious future as well. Now, when we were in Exodus last time, a couple of weeks ago, we were reminding each other that uh, prior to this, God had set up Joseph. Remember there was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And Joseph was the one who was uh, sold into slavery by his brothers. And But that was all designed by God to to make sure that God's people would continue on and the promises he made would come to fruition because uh, there was going to be a famine in the land and Joseph was a godsend. He was a timely uh, situation for the people of Israel because he was able to prepare uh, some uh, silos or whatever uh, for the food in the good times. He warned the people of Egypt about that and they had uh, uh, food. And then in due course, Joseph's family were able to come down to Egypt and partake of what God had got organised for them prior to that. But time went on, and you're reading Exodus chapter 1 here in verse 6, and Joseph died. Well, that's what happens if you live long enough. All his brethren, all the generation, and the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. We're talking about the land of Egypt here. The, the people had come down from the, what we know today generally is the land of Canaan, the Israel section, the Palestine area, in fact, some of uh, that part was where they moved from, and they moved into Egypt to find this food that Joseph was there ahead of them. Now Joseph died, and of course all his family had, had passed away as well, and so the generations were going on, and they were filling up the land of Egypt. And uh, in verse 8, now there arose a new king over Egypt, a different pharaoh, different dynasty altogether, as a matter of fact, which knew not Joseph. Knew not about the story of Joseph and how his time was in prison and how he warned the Pharaoh at that time about the impending famine. So he didn't know anything about that. Or if he did know that, it didn't impress him all that much or he wasn't all that interested anymore. He was a new Pharaoh. He was going to exercise his uh, reign and his uh, domain. Uh, so uh, he was also concerned that these people might pose a threat uh, to them. So the, uh, verse 14, you read there, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage. So this particular pharaoh uh, hard and put them in bitter bitch. And uh, the people of this And then miraculously, really, the cause of pharaoh. Uh, but the time was coming to deliver his people. You go to chapter 3 and verse 10. Come now, therefore, and I will to Moses now, unto the Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So Moses was called and set up and encouraged to, to be delivered, to be sent to deliver his people uh, out of their bondage. So he was a godsend as well. And godsend is obviously a very timely and appropriate uh, situation. In this case, it's a person in the name of Moses. Uh, chapter 4, Exodus chapter 4, 
in verse 17. When God sends someone, he doesn't send him in his own devices. He doesn't send him, well, do your best, old fellow, and see what you can do. Uh, we read here in verse 17, And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, this is God speaking to Moses, wherewith thou shalt do signs. So Moses was equipped with the rod or the authority of God, the backing and confirmation of God. God never sends us out unequipped. And so there were signs and wonders and miracles at the hand at the disposal of Moses to demonstrate to the people of Egypt we're dealing here with the true God. We're dealing with the only one and only God. And so anybody that God sends out, including us, he equips us with Holy Ghost power, with the rod of authority to be able to represent him and do signs and miracles. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. These signs shall follow them that believe. That was the message and that's the commission, of course. <laughs> Chapter 5. We might have all of that, but it's not always easy going. We might run into some Buddhists or some Muslims or some other people or out now atheists or whatever. And so in chapter 5, verse 1, And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a, they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And so there's the opposition. The resistance is always there. I don't know God. I don't believe what you're saying. I don't believe there is a God. Uh, and there are people who've got all their arguments, whether they be religious or atheistic arguments or theological or uh, philosophical arguments. They've got all their reasons why they're not going to be involved, why they're not going to do what the Bible says, why they're not going to embrace his word or his truth or his spirit or the power of God. And there's always been opposition. There will always be opposition. No matter when we go out or where we go out, the battle is on, of course. Uh, but God was always going to keep his promise, chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6 and verse 6. Wherefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments, and I will take you to me for a people. And I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Pharaoh didn't know God, but my people will know God. Now this is a story about Egypt, but it's a story about the world. The world represented here by Egypt. The world is often represented in that particular way. And there are the, the prince of this world, the, the Pharaoh of this world, the devil himself, who, who's uh, wanting to devour, wanting to deceive, wanting to perpetrate lies uh, and so on. And, uh, and the people of this world, but they know it or not, I mean, what their lifestyle is, that they're captive to Egypt. They're captive to the prince of this world. They don't understand they're dealing with uh, these uh, situations, uh, but we do, and we've been delivered, and we're still uh, making a thesis that we're in the wilderness to the Lord, and the Lord's still got a wonderful promise to fulfil in our lives. In the meantime, this is an illustration to God's people back then, hey, I'm with you. I know what you're going through. I know the circumstance you're contending with. I know what has come against you. However, I am God and uh, my people will know me and will have trust and confidence in me that I will fulfil my word. Verse 8, and I will bring you into, into the land concerning the which I did swear to give to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob, promises that were repeated and reiterated to these patriarchs in the Old Testament. And I will give it to you for an inheritance. I am the Lord. There's a wonderful lot of information in that phrase. I am the Lord, which means I am the omnipotent one. I'm the omniscient one. I'm the omnipresent one. I'm the all in all. I am that I am one. And uh, it's summed up in a line. I will do what I said. There's no shadow of telling in me. There's no lies in me. There's no deceptions. I'm not a man that I would lie. I'm not concocting ideas. It's true. I am God. And what I've said I will do and what I promised I'll bring to pass. And he's re reiterating that to uh, Moses to say, the victory will come. The victory is ours. We sing it, of course. Over to chapter 7. In all these things, God could do it in a variety of ways. And he has done different things at different times. But he, he uses people as his agents. And in verse 7 of chapter 7, he says, And Moses was fourscore years old, and Aaron fourscore and three years old, when they spoke unto Pharaoh. So when they were the godsends, they were 80 years old and 83 years old. 
I've got a few years to go yet to get to 83, so I'm all right. Um, well, that's according to this, but I may not live that long, of course. But these two started their journey to Pharaoh and to the opposition that Pharaoh was going to generate at 80 and 83 years of age. So they still have a few of us here. What follows here, by the way, they were God sins, just like you and I have God sins. Uh, to deliver Israel in that case, we deliver the people from the bondage. We don't do it personally any more than Aaron and Moses did it personally. It was God, of course, in his power and, and his goodness and his love and his grace and his mercy that brought these things to pass. And what follows is the ten plagues. And I think most people have heard of the ten plagues, but they've heard of the Bible much. But they've probably seen the movies, of course, because it's portrayed in movies, the ten plagues. And sometimes when people refer to when there's, there's things happen on the planet today, they say, oh, it's, it's like biblical proportions. They reflect back to the days of the Bible when there were plagues and things happened back then, not just the ten here, but other things that happened. And, oh, it's, and they refer to the Bible. It's amazing how people can refer to the Bible quite often, how they can refer to God quite often. They don't believe in God, they don't believe in the Bible. But we can bandy the terms around when it suits us or when we feel so inclined. But anyway, we've got ten plagues here. Now, they're not just random plagues. They're miraculous, even though they've been challenged down through the ages. And they're meaningful, very meaningful. And God was wanting to make sure he got a message across here. Why these plagues? Well, all of the stories of these things are sort of known down in history. Three and a half thousand years later, we're still making films about the Exodus and the Red Sea and what led up to it. And the battles have followed afterwards and so on. We're very caught up with the idea, but not necessarily going to respond to the spiritual lessons it's teaching us here. And, and there is a lesson here. God is uh, certainly having a go initially at the self-sufficiency of the Egyptians of this world and their gods and their goddesses. The Egyptians had something like 1,500 named gods and goddesses of an amazing variety of things. Pharaoh himself was a god. As far as they were concerned. And uh, they were wealthy, powerful, prestigious. They uh, had all sorts of things going for them, their lifestyle, and so on. And they believed in their self sufficiency. They believed in their gods and goddesses. They believed in their power and pomp and ceremony. They believed in all of those things. And God here, uh, step by step, was attacking the very fabric of the Egyptian society, the very philosophical approach that they had from the beginning and was demonstrating there is no salvation outside of me. There is no hope outside of me. There is no security outside of me. And he demonstrates that there's a lesson to be taught. Don't trust in yourselves. You've got to rely on God. You've got to trust in me, he's saying to you. Um, I'll just tell a few things down. He wanted Israel to know that he is Lord. Remember we read that before, that he is Lord and there's no other. I have no rivals. I'm not in competition with anybody. I stand alone, and I am needed to be obeyed. And that was the lesson. Israel was learning the lesson through the plagues that there was deliverance through God. Egypt was learning the lesson that there is death and judgment through God if you don't respond. There was a serious lesson through these plagues. Step by step, God was exercising his authority over every aspect of this universe and beyond. And he was letting them know as he's letting us know as well. In the midst of that, what seems severe and harsh, God demonstrates his love and his grace and his mercy. He provides a way of escape. He always provides a way of escape. He always demonstrates an opportunity for us to embrace that love and the grace and mercy. And so it was back here. He wanted us to know all of those things. Now, Egypt was full of idols, and, of course, we know, we know how the world is today. You know there are religions that have got millions of idols. Even some of the Christian so-called religions have idols, icons, images, statues, bleeding hearts, pictures, relics, all sorts of things. And yet they, they claim to read the same Bible that you and I read. Let me read a bit to you. Exodus 20. Thou shalt, this is God's word, not mine. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, no graven images, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water. Now, you couldn't get any clearer than that, could you? What God thinks of those things. But it's not just about image in the statues. We know that Pastor Laurie mentioned last week about dumb idols. Well, well that's obvious. We, the Bible speaks of them 
disparagingly, of course, about how we cut a tree down and we carve it into a shape of a god, then we want it to talk to us, which is just nonsense, of course. But there's other things that become our idols. In this world, we have things like what, the Australian Idol or the British Idol. We have pop stars, movie stars, uh, sporting stars, and they become, for many, many people, their idols. In fact, the definition I read, it says, it is anything. What is an idol? It is anything more to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. That's an idol. Now, there are a lot of things that occupy our time and energy. Of course, they have to. There are a lot of things that we've got to put in our the problem, but we are the problem. We, unfortunately, as a, as a peoples generally, allow a lot of things to dominate our life, to, to uh, distract us, to consume us, really, in our energies and time and devotion and, and love and thought about and so on. And what God is saying to us here is, no, no, you've got to focus on me. I know you've got to do other things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and my righteousness. I'll look after you in other things. And unfortunately, there's a, a myriad of things. Uh, I just read a little article that said a person can be consumed with a career, making money, personal achievement, a job, study, saving a place, social standing, the perfect family, children, a romantic relationship, beauty, popularity, intelligence, body image, sport, hobbies, pride, power, control, happiness, or whatever. The list is endless. There's so many things out there that we can find ourselves devoting our time and energy to. As far as God is concerned, they themselves are not necessarily a problem, but we can make them a problem, and we can actually, in the end, look like we're worshipping them because we spend so much time and energy and devotion to them. And that was the thing that God was making uh, a statement about. These be thy gods, O Israel. I will have no other gods before me, he said. I'm not going to be competing. It is me. I stand alone. I am your unique God. Your heavenly Father, you need to owe me the respect and pay me the respect that I deserve. So, in other words, God is saying here, I believe He's saying very strongly through these Ten Commandments, the Ten Plagues, that uh, we uh, we need to make sure that we rely on God, that we, we're, we're focusing on God. It doesn't mean you can't do other things. It just simply means that our number one priority in our life, if there's decisions to be made, God comes first. If there's choices, God comes first. If it's lifestyle, if it's life, God comes first. That's how it must be, of course. And uh, nothing else will save you. No matter what else you've got, it won't save you. Now, I don't know how we're going to go today, but we'll chapter 7, verse 17. Thus saith the Lord, uh, in this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. So in this, in the ten plagues that are coming, you will know that I am Lord. Now, that's the real message here, isn't it? I want you to know that I am God, and there is none else beside me. I want Israel to know it. I want Egypt to know it. I want uh, the year 2016 people to know it. I want the world to know this is the way it is. Behold, I will smite thee with the rod that is in thine hand. This, by the way, is, a, is a, a God saying to Moses what Moses had to say when he got to the Pharaoh. So Moses was asked to say this, but he was now being told by God to start with. Thus saith the Lord, in this, in this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in my hand upon the waters which are in the river, as the river Nile, and thou shalt be turned to blood. And the fish that is in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe the drink of the water of the river. Now, there are a lot of skeptics about these ten plagues. You can read lots of stuff. If you want to Google, which I don't recommend, a lot of Googling is not recommended because you end up with a lot of rubbish on your plate. Uh, but if you were to Google this, you would find that a lot of people have got explanations about how this all happened uh, and uh, what, what natural event caused this. Some red silk or something or other came into the river. It's amazing how Moses could predict it was going to happen, but anyway, leaving all that aside, there are, there are explanations abounding out there to try and explain this. It's miraculous. We don't want to explain it any other way. It's miraculous. This is the river Nile. And the river Nile was the life source of Egypt. It still is, although it's should fall for it. Uh, but, but back then, they had a god and goddesses for the river Nile. And they used to worship the river Nile because it was the life source. Where the waters run, there is life. And that's what they uh, really were focusing on. 
and, uh, and they, they had, I'm not going to name all the gods that they had in China, I can't even pronounce them. But if you go through this, God is going to work his way from this right to the very end, from the source of life here to the life source at the very end here, which is God Almighty, of course. Um, so the night was sacred to them. It was, uh, it, it was what they sort of tended their life around. And now they couldn't use it to cook or to drink or to wash or do anything. It was putrid to them. It was certainly a shot at those gods. It was a broadside, an insight to the gods they had back then that they thought this was... Uh, going to sustain them in some way or other. And the fish were killed. They had fish gods too, by the way. And the common person, that was a main diet for the common person, fish. And so that was hit, even home there as well. Now, I'm not going to dwell on all this, but you've got to remember that maybe uh, the Lord was having a certain big here because the, the Egyptians were going to kill the Israelites, in, the babies, taken down the River Nile and drowned down there. And now the Lord said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do with your River Nile. And I think this is the message all the way through. I'm letting you know, O Israel and O Egypt, what I am able to do. And, and Israel learned a lesson. Don't rely on those type of things. They didn't learn their lesson, I might add. The Egyptians uh, would eventually thrust them out. Uh, but unfortunately, the Egypt was still in the Israelites, uh, tragically enough. Um, <laughs> I better keep moving quickly. I might not be able to get through all these, I might just summarise them. Exodus chapter 8 and verse 2, it says, And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all thy borders with frogs. So we're just coming out of the water now, tadpoles turning into frogs, coming out of the water. You will see step by step God is just moving upon the land of Egypt and their gods. They had frog gods, by the way. Um, and the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house, into thy bedchamber and upon thy bed, into the house of thy servants, upon thy people, in thy ovens, and in thy kneading troughs. And the frogs shall come up both on thee and upon thy people, and upon all the, thy servants. <laughs> I admit, imagine a few of us don't like frogs and that, you know, maybe the odd one. Uh, but uh, I read this little article. When you went to bed at night, you went to bed at night with the frogs. Cold, slimy frogs. When you were kneading the dough, you kneaded it in frogs. When you bake, you bake the frogs in the bread. When you cook the soup, you cook frogs. They fell into the soup. When you sat down to eat, when you started to cut a piece of meat, you cut a leg off or a head off a frog. They were everywhere. In the land of Egypt, by the way, no one dared to kill one of these frogs. They were sacred. They were worshipped. What a, what a problem that would be. They were also the god of fertility. And I think God was saying, oh, You've got a fertility. Well, I'll just show you some multiplication. And here we go. Cover the land with frogs. Croaking gods everywhere. Yes. How stupid. Their, their god of fertility was, was depicted with a frog's head. I don't know why they did those things. I don't know why they did them now. People are stupid. We know that. But uh, uh, that's what they did. You want frogs? I'll give you some frogs. Um, verse 16. <laughs> And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, stretch uh, out the rod and smite the dust of the land, that it may become life throughout all the land of Egypt. So now we've just crept onto the land now, now God's going to move upon the land. He's going to create out of the dust the lice there. We don't even know exactly what they were, what type of lice. You know, some people suggest that they might be uh, sand flies and, and dust mites or various other people. Who knows? It doesn't matter. And whatever they were, they weren't pleasant. And they did so, for Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth. And it became lice in a man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. So step by step, now we've got, well, by the way, there was a god of the earth who was supposed to look after the earth for them. Uh, the Egyptians were incredibly clean, clean scrupulously so. So they, this would have been, you can imagine having you know, lice on you and so on, on the animals as well. That was a, a, a very clear religious defilement. And the priests couldn't go to the temples because of this because they were defiled with lice. Uh, so the land became a curse to them, this land that was being protected by the of God. Um, over to uh, verse 21. This is uh, number four. Else if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies. It says in the margin, a mixture of noisome beasts. So it's another translation, divers flies. Might be all sorts of flies. Uh, it might have even been beetles, some suggest, because the beetle was certainly uh, very much in favour. If you went to various temples, there's lots of uh, pictures of, of beetles. They worship beetles for some reason or other. Uh, 
And so it might not be the people. The, thing, the Lord's are now moving from the land into the air now, and he's now got winged deities that he's uh, having a shot at as well. And, and just imagine, I mean, nothing worse. I remember going to Dubbo Western Plains Zoo one. I think it's a Western Plains Zoo there. And we, uh, we got out of the car and uh, we started you know, do a bit of cooking and stuff, and all of a sudden your plate was covered with, with flies. My wife would remember this, it was hideous. And we couldn't uh, forget it. We hopped back in the car and got out of there. Uh, you'd imagine being having all of that, just what was it say there? Into the houses, into the houses of the Egyptians, they didn't have fly screens then, to be full of swarms of flies and also the ground went on they are. Flies everywhere, up your nostrils, in your hair. Uh, oh, yeah. And I was severed uh, in that day the land of Goshen, so I'm going to protect my people. So uh, uh, God was certainly, well, firing broadsides at all of their ideas and concepts. Uh, Maybe what people not fly, it doesn't matter anyway. Uh, incredibly annoying and destructive. Chapter 9 and uh, verse 3. Behold, this is number five now. Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon the cattle which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, upon the sheep that shall be a very grievous mirror. And the Lord shall sever between the, the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt and so on. So God was going to protect his people. But now we're really getting close to home. We're getting to the, to the animals that the Egyptians used. It was a sign of their wealth. Uh, uh, they, they worshipped them, they had uh, sacred bulls, they had temples to these animals, devoted to them, uh, and now these animals have come down with some incredible disease or other. Uh, so they're losing their, their ability to do what they were hoping to do with the animals on the land and so on, uh, and they're uh, also losing uh, their wealth and prestige because of, it, of these sacred animals with this disease. Uh, they had a particular god that was a, a sacred bull god, uh, they had a cow-headed goddess, uh, they had all these sorts of uh, gods and goddesses which they uh, they wanted to be uh, demonstrating their loyalty and their honours to and so on. Uh, verse 8, I'm moving quickly. Uh, uh, yes, chapter 9 and verse 8. This is number 5. This is number 6, sorry. Number 6. Uh, verse 8, number 6. And the Lord said unto Moses, unto Aaron, take to you handfuls of ashes of the furnace, and let Moses bring them toward the heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. If he should do it that way, the magicians used to do this. When they want to pronounce a blessing or a cursing upon things and do their little magic tricks, they would take the ashes and sprinkle it on some object or sprinkle it upon a person and pronounce their blessing or cursing or whatever. And God's ridiculing it. There's no doubt about that. He's ridiculing what they're doing. And it shall become small dust in all the land of Egypt, and shall be a boil breaking out forth with blames upon a man and upon beast throughout all the land of Egypt. Now we are here, now we are getting close to home. Now each individual person not only suffer the, the loss of other things, of the inconvenience and the stench and all the rest of it, now they've got boils on them. I think anybody who's had a boil or something like a boil knows what a boil is like. If you're covered with boils, if everybody around you is covered with boils, no one's going to give you any sympathy, no one's going to care two hoots. They had a god of medicine. Not working too well here. They had a physician God, not working too well here, obviously. And God again was ridiculing the whole situation. Verse 18, which is now number 7. Verse uh, chapter 9, verse 18. Behold, tomorrow about the time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as has not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. And if you go down to verse 23 of the same chapter. And Moses stretched forth his rod towards heaven. So now we're moving beyond uh, from the water onto the land, onto animals, onto the human beings. Now we're going to the heavens, as it were, into the, the realm more above. Not the heaven, of course, but the, but the realm above. And, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along the ground, and the ground that the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt. Uh, since it became a nation. And the hail smoked throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hail smoked every herd of the field and broke every tree to the, of the field. And again, Goshen was despair. It's another story. We, we should talk about that, how the Lord puts a difference between himself and his people. That's our whole talk. And so once again, the goddess of the sky, the headwork, was being conquered. And uh, out of the sky, 
no control of the goddess came of this great power, and God was demonstrating his power is widespread. I control the universe. I control the elements. I control the very heavens themselves. So we've got this total ruin now of Egypt. But that's, that's not quite finished yet. Uh, chapter 10 and verse 4. Else if thou, this is number, number uh, 8 now. If thou refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring the locusts into thy coast, and they shall cover the face of the earth. By the face of the earth, we don't mean the whole guy, they didn't come down to Australia. They're just a local area, of course. Uh, that's another story about how we discussed the flood and uh, people. Uh, we know it just means the local earth because uh, in verse 14 it says the land of Egypt. We're talking about exactly the same thing. It's the land of Egypt. And they shall cover the land of Egypt. It would seem like people there, that this is just everywhere. Maybe the whole earth is covered or something. Like that. And one, one cannot be able to see the earth, that territory. And they shall eat the residue of that which is escaped. So anything that uh, you know might have slightly been there, left by the hail and the fire and so on, now the locusts come in to make the absolute complete destruction of everything. The locusts are going to wipe out all the vegetation, all that was left from the previous uh, uh, seven uh, plagues. They shall fill thy houses and the houses of all thy servants and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither the fathers nor thy father's father have said those things since the day that are upon the earth unto this day. And he turned himself and went out from Pharaoh. So uh, they, uh, it was a complete devastation. And of course, uh, we can read in verse 13, And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind. So it's, it's under God's control. God brought this in. God controls the winds. God controls the elements. God controls what he's going to bring in or not bring in. God is going to uh, demonstrate here that he is uh, uh, totally in charge of every aspect of this universe. And total ruination came upon them. Chapter 10 and verse 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. Wow. And Moses spread forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. And they saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days, but all the children that had life in their dwellings. What a wonderful contrast. Uh, but you imagine darkness. Darkness is always a bit of a worry, but I mean, absolute darkness. Not a glimmer of light. One of their chief gods was Ra, the, the god of the sun. They had other gods and goddesses of, of the sun as well. But what a, a shot at that. Total darkness. The, if God turns the light off, the light's turned off. There's nothing, there's no glimmer, not anything. Now, presumably you'd say, well, why didn't they try to light a fire? God obviously didn't allow any fires. There was no lights. God did not allow any light. He was demonstrating to the world, this world is darkness. Egypt was darkness. This world is darkness. We have our little lights. God says, no, 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 they're nothing. I don't count whatsoever. It's God who produces light. It's God who said in the beginning, uh, when the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters, and we started our plague with the waters, and the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters in Genesis uh, 1, and God said, let there be light. God's in control of the waters and everything that flows from them and beyond and the elements of the universe, and he's in control of what is light and darkness. I am light. And what is darkness? You can't produce darkness. You just take light away, that's all. You can't turn the switch on. I think I'll have to turn the switch of darkness on. No, you turn the switch of light off. And that's exactly what God did. So that's all there is. If God turns the light off, if God does not the light of our life, if God is not uh, uh, demonstrating that uh, necessary ingredient in our life, light and water are two necessary ingredients for life then we're in darkness. And God was explaining that. Life uh, was, was vital. Life was vital to life, of course. And it would seem like that their major God was dead, no doubt. Uh, what, what an alarm and horror. Just imagine, you're thinking that you're lying there, you can't move, you can't, you, you, no doubt you could walk around if you wanted to, but you couldn't see any single thing whatsoever. So you'd be stumbling around, so you just stay put for a while. Another day goes by, you stay put for a while. Another day goes by and you stay put for a while. I wonder what they were thinking. How long is this going to last for? What's going to happen? Did they think, wow, 
we should be doing something about this. Chapter 11. The final, I guess I seal on the coffin, but it was. Chapter 11, verse 1, And Moses said unto the, the Lord and the Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards he will let you go hence. When he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out hence all together. Verse 4, And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight I will speak it, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, that sits upon his throne. And by the way, the firstborn of Pharaoh was going to be the next god. The next god was going to die. That's been, this is the final nail in the coffin, isn't it? The Lord is saying here, there is no future outside of me. There is no hope. There's no posterity. There is no salvation. There is no heritage. You've got nothing, Pharaoh. You claim to be a god. You're next in line. You're supposed to be the next god. He won't survive the night nor anybody else that's putting a hope in their, their lineage or their future in that way. That sits upon the throne, even upon the firstborn of the maid servant that is behind the mill and all the firstborn of the beasts as well. The first cow is going to die. There should be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, just as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast. That you may know how that the Lord has put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Wonderful verses, those. Hands up those who are their firstborn. You are the firstborn in your family. You're the firstborn in your family. Well, at midnight tonight, if you're in Egypt, you'd be dead. <laughs> That's pretty horrific, isn't it? If you think about it. I was the firstborn in my family, I wouldn't have survived. My mother was the firstborn in her family. Be dead too. It's a lie. So it's pretty horrific. And God made provision, of course, as we well know. The firstborn was always regarded as so special. Not so much nowadays, although it still works, you know, in certain uh, dynasties, uh, but not so much for us necessarily. But they had a God called the protector of the children. <laughs> God called the protector of the children. Didn't have any protecting that night. Right? No such God, of course. Naturally. And God uh, could not make his judgment any clearer, surely. There is no future, no hope whatsoever outside of God, the one and only God. Whether it be the waters or frogs or lions or flies or cattle or boys or hail or locusts or darkness or this point, uh, it makes no difference. Now, the people challenge us. I read a little article. I don't know how accurately some of these things are, of course, but uh, I'm sure it's uh, got some relevance. In 1828, the museum in Holland acquired a papyrus which came from Memphis, not Memphis, Tennessee, but uh, Egypt. It was written by a scribe called Ipua. I'm not sure how to say pronounce his name, but he's well and truly dead, he can't correct me. And it, this particular papyrus gives a graphic description of the condition of Egypt at the time of, the, uh, of his writing. Archaeologists are not agreed about the exact time the document was originally written. A reading of it sounds very much like an echo of the biblical account. So I quote from this uh, historical writing. Nay, but the heart is violent. Plague stalks through the land, and blood is everywhere. Nay, but the river is blood. Does a man drink from it? As a human, he rejects it. He thirsts for water. Nay, but gates, columns, and walls are consumed with fire. Nay, but men are few. He that lays his brother in the ground is everywhere. Nay, but the son of the high-born uh, man is no longer to be recognised. The stranger people from outside are coming to Egypt. <coughs> Nay, but corn has perished everywhere. People are stripped of clothing, perfume and oil. Everyone says there is no more. The storehouse is bare. It has all come to this. Well, I don't know exactly what that was referring to, but uh, it does sound quite like it might have been referring to what we're talking about today, doesn't it? Uh, <coughs> let's go to chapter 12. We, we recognise, of course, that ultimate sin ends up in death. Now, we can argue about the goodness or severity of God. We, we know that God is both. And we need to rejoice in his goodness, hallelujah, but we need to be mindful of his severity. And there's no good us standing up on the platform saying, oh, it's not fair. God shouldn't be like this. Uh, that's not the way my mind is a big picture of God. I've got a different sort of God. God is all loving and all embracing and all accepting. No, he isn't. And he's letting the Egyptians know, letting the world know, no, I'm not. You've got to do it my way. 
He couldn't make it any clearer through those ten plagues. Surely not. That you'll do it my way. Now he made provision for people to do it his way. And there were non-Israelites that escaped out of the land of Egypt. There were people who embraced it and came. And so it, it's available. God is, is merciful. He, he'll give people a chance, of course. Um, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 3. Speak out of the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the house not be too little for the lamb, let, let him and his neighbour next to his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make you account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You can take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now, this, of course, is moving into what we know as the Passover. Now, I haven't got time today. We're going over time, so I've got to stop. But we want to go into that. The lamb we're talking about here is a literal lamb. They had to literally kill a lamb. They had to go and take the blood, the literal blood of the lamb. They had to go inside the house. They had to put it around the lentils of the door. They had to stay put. They had to be covered by the blood. And when the angel moved across the land and was uh, uh, identifying the firstborn and slaying the firstborn of every... Family, including the Israelites, if they didn't do this. But they were given provision how to escape. When God's judgment comes against this world, it's coming against everybody except those who have availed themselves of the way of escape. So God always gives us an opportunity. We're covered by the blood today. We're going to celebrate it again as it were. We're going to remember and reflect as we partake of the communion in a little while. The blood of the Lamb, the spotless Lamb of God, is our covering. We need to stay in the house. When you're saying the body of Christ, the church, we need to have the blood that's covering us. If they did all of that, the angel passed over them. That's why it's called the Passover. We'll discuss it maybe in more detail later. There's some interesting aspects, the lessons to learn back then. But on that night, just as God has said, the angel of death passed over the whole land. He passed over the household completely where the blood was identified. What was he looking for? What was the angel of death looking for? A pretty house? Four bedrooms in a study, en suite, nice front yard, flowers growing well, two cars in the driveway. What was he looking for? What was the only thing the angel of death was looking for? The blood of the lamb. That's all. And if the blood of the lamb was there, he passed over. And if the blood of the lamb was there, the people were safe inside. He made provision for them. What an incredible spiritual lesson. We cannot afford to be uncovered. We cannot afford to be outside the blood of the Lamb. Now, the blood of the Lamb is not literal blood of Jesus Christ. And it's, we know it's uh, the application of the Spirit. What it's saying here is abide in the Spirit. Abide in the confines of the spiritualness of your life in the church. Make sure that you're rock solid in those things. Now, I've got a number of scriptures I'm going to quote, but we've run out of time for those. But we might be able to quote them another day. But we, this is a time for us to reflect anyway on the goodness of our God. We've reflected for a while, maybe too long, on, on the, the severity of God, the ten plagues. doesn't do us any harm. If you thought that was uh, pretty hard, that's mine. Compared to what the Lord's got in mind for the second judgment coming here in this world. The Lord's got something pretty heavy happening, and we need to be very aware of that. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Could the Israelites escape? Going out to kick the football for a while, Dad? No, 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 no. You come inside, my boy, and stay inside. Kitty Boots, the firstborn. Come inside. Stay under the blood. In other words, the message is don't be silly, of course. The, the, the reminder here is that. Uh, the judgment is coming. That's what those plagues are about. A reminder to the world, judgment is coming. And we saw last night at our little east thing, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, that was just another judgment. God has lots of judgments, but the big one's coming. And God is not willing that any should uh, uh, perish, really. He wants people to escape. He didn't want any of those people to die. They didn't want to listen to it. They wouldn't respond to it. That's the consequences of disobedience, rebellion, rejection of the principles of God. Uh, the world is divided as it was back there in two groups. Back then there were two classes of people. Like Pharaoh, I know not the Lord. The Egyptians, 
who wanted to be in the world, who wanted to live their life in the world. And then there's the Israelite people. The same today. There's the world and there's the church. Two classes of people. Those that know God and those that don't know God. Those who are obedient to God and those who are not obedient to God. Those of you who want to be in it and those who don't want to be in it. Those who are finding all sorts of excuses and others are finding reasons to be part of God's kingdom. There was Moses and Pharaoh. It's now Jesus and the prince of this world. It's also us, of course, and all those, unfortunately, who are not willing to experience the same power that we've been so graciously given. Uh, instead of those who apply the blood of the lamb to the doorposts and so on, and those who are not interested in the blood of the lamb at all. And, 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 and rubbish, really, the whole concept of Jesus and of God. And we invent a whole new alternative. We have evolution now. We've got our own gods. Evolution, you know, is it, it's really a god. It's a, it's a, a reason somehow or other that this world came into being. How could that be? How is it possible? Any logical common sense would tell you it's impossible, but we're not motivated by common sense. Common sense would tell you if you put a frog's head on some piece of wood or something other, it's not going to do anything for you. Common sense would tell us if you put on the wall a pulsating heart of Jesus that lights up when you walk in the room, it isn't going to do anything for you. Common sense will tell you if you put a trinket around your neck, even if it'll be a cross, it will do nothing for you. Common sense will tell you all of that, but the world is full of that nonsense. I guess it's for one reason only. There's not a lot of common sense out there. Not a lot of knowledge of God out there. Not a lot of understanding and appreciation. So just including, I've gone out so I apologise. But it's a, a stark lesson. Let's make sure we make the right choices. Choose you this day whom you will serve. It's only one camp or the other. There's no betweens. There's no purgatory. There's no limbo. There's no uh, halfway houses. There's nothing like the media, what is it, the middle road cafe or something or other. In the past, a while of place. A Baptist church at the middle of the road cafe or something like that. Yeah, that is in the middle of the road. That's where you run over. <laughs> there's no middle of the road. You're either in or you're out. You're either for me or against me. You're either gathering or scattering. There is no halfway houses in God's kingdom. Never has been. You can't be halfway out of Egypt. You can't be halfway across the Red Sea. If you're halfway across the Red Sea, what happens to you? You drown. Simple as that. You're all the way or you're no way. And that's the message of the Bible. And so it's a message to us. We're constantly reminding ourselves. Well, we know we live in trouble times, and there's lots of distractions out there. There are distractions for me as well as you. There are distractions for all of us. And the, the stark lesson is, hey, remember what happens. And also remember how good God has been to us. We're going to partake of the communion of us. How good has God been to us? He allowed his son to shed his blood that we might be able to apply that to our house through the Spirit. Hallelujah. All the people.